nice weekends were bound. It rained a lot, so the dogs made the house muddy, but otherwise I got to sleep in, which is great. Today is Monday, February 7th. As a brief reminder, because I didn't actually change it until just now, the homework and quiz are not due tonight. They, I have currently made them due Friday, but I may actually, that is where they will currently sit uh, for now, but if the week goes on, I might revise that if I need to. Um, today and the rest of this week, we're gonna continue looking at chapter two. Uh, right now we're looking at work and friction, and today we're going to begin looking at energy types, because work is the act of using up energy, and so we need to talk about energy itself and the various forms that it can occupy. Uh, we also have lab this week, normal uh, come to the lab room type lab, but there's a small extra part that we're going to be doing that I wanted to go ahead and tell everyone about so that you knew about it ahead of time. Uh, this department has a, sorry, just forgot how to speak. We have a kind of process that we go through at the start of every semester to take data about the amount of physics our students know at the start of the class so that we can compare it to the amount of physics that students know at the end of the class and so that we can see you know, if we're teaching well, what things that we need to teach better and start looking into new ways to teach whatever we happen to be lacking in. Um, to take that data, uh, we have new students and we're a little late doing it this year because of some hiccups and we apologize. Um, to take this data, uh, students will you will take a brief 30 minute non-graded multiple choice concept no math concept only scantron assignment at the start of lab this week that we will use for that data as your starting benchmark so that we can compare it to how you're viewing at the end of the semester so we can make the department and our physics classes even better it is not graded for accuracy because the goal is to honestly see what things people understand when they begin versus when they end. So I encourage you to just, when you do it, it'll be a Scantron thing. You don't have to do any math. It's just fill in a bubble. Um, I encourage you to give your best uh, answer on every single question, and it'll be done in 30 minutes maximum. And then we will move on to the, the rest of the lab for, that, for this week. Um, it is required, you are graded for doing it, but it is not graded for accuracy. You'll get the participation grade just by doing it and turning it in. Uh, how's that feel for right now? Okay. Um, whenever your lab time is, that's the first thing we'll do at the beginning this week so that it's just done and over with and then we can move on to the rest of the assignment which will involve forces and friction and work. You'll be dragging something across the table, measuring the forces involved, calculating the friction involved. And then at the end of the semester, you're able to do the, the same 30 minute Scantron assessment. We'll just compare how everyone improved so that future students can learn even better. And we appreciate you, your time and your data. So thank you guys. Um, today in lecture, we will I think I already mentioned this. Yeah, we're gonna keep looking at work, how friction plays into work, and then looking at different forms of energy. So, any questions about anything before we begin today? All right. Do chime in with any inquiries you have at any time. Last time, we left off here. As a brief reminder, we've been talking about the physics concept of work. Whenever you use force to move an object some distance, you are using up energy, you are performing work. Work is a measurement of the energy you used up. So uh, joules represents a, the metric unit of energy. Now, um, this one that should be in your notes is also now on this corner of the board where it will remain for today. Using that formula, I want to 
pose all of you two very quick questions. I'd like you to come up with an answer to in the next minute or two on your own. <coughs> Um, let's say someone pushes a large box horizontally across the floor. Uh, they're exerting a force of 50 newtons, and the box slides 10 meters in the same direction. So, first question is, how much work do, does the box pusher per do in this task? And second question, how much work does gravity do in this task? Give everyone a minute just to see what numbers you come up with, and then we'll compare. So, how much work does the human do in this situation? Almost. Very good. 500 joules. Does anyone disagree? All right. And to show quickly where that number comes from, we do 50, we take, sorry, exert a force of 50 newtons, the box moves 10 meters. So 50 times 10 is just 500, and the unit is joules, that is the energy that the person uses up performing that task. Since this is energy, we could, in theory, figure out how many calories this takes, which means we could also figure out how many granola bars it takes to power this action. So <clears throat> that is the work the human accomplishes. How much work does gravity do in this situation? 1,000 makes a lot of sense. Gravity is a force. So that force of 100 newtons is acting on this box as it is sliding. And so if we were to multiply 100 newtons times 10 <coughs> meters, we would get an answer of 1,000 joules. There is a small problem with that, though and it's in these two bars. The for in order to successfully do the work, the force has to be parallel to the displacement. The displacement is in the x-axis, and gravity points down. Are those parallel? No. No. So, and this is, this is the correct first thought to have. This is a correct first instinct. But upon realizing they are not parallel, I will now explain what that means numerically. Let's say we look, gravity is going to exert a 100 Newton force in the y-axis. That is a true fact. So I'm gonna just label that a little bit, 100 y. So for the formula to work correctly, we would need to plug in the y-axis displacement instead of the x-axis displacement. If we're sliding sideways, what is our y-axis displacement? It's zero. There is not any. And so that is one of two ways to get a zero answer. There is a second way. And let's say that, if we look at the other part of this formula, all right, the box is sliding to the right, so let's plug in 
that distance in the x-axis. So now we need to plug in graph the force gravity exerts in that parallel x-axis. What is the x component of the force of gravity in this situation? Zero. It's also still zero, because gravity doesn't work in the x-axis. So that's two different ways of getting a zero answer. So in this specific case, because the box is moving in the x-axis, gravity is not doing any work. It's not accomplishing anything. Gravity's contribution doesn't amount to anything as far as we are concerned. How does this feel so far? Okay. Uh, I've got a few other, a few more quick rapid fire questions. The next one, uh, let's do, instead of pushing something across the floor, let's lift something upwards. That's another task that takes work and that definitely requires energy. So let's just, let's examine a situation where someone is lifting a two kilogram mass upwards. So box, two kilograms, and it is going to be lifted three meters into the air. How would we go about finding the work that this feat requires? Yes, um, however, I would, good instinct. The way that I would describe that is we need to figure out how much the box weighs. It has such a mass, gravity is going to pull down on it and we will pull, exert a force upwards on it to counteract gravity. So if we figure out how much the box weighs, that tells us the minimum force we would have to use to lift it upwards. So, correct, very good. We know the distance, we just need to get the force first. So, Fg is mass times 9.8. So, to find our work, the force we exert upwards times our y displacement, this is vertical, so I'm going to make it a y, the force we exert is going to be equal and opposite to gravity at minimum. To lift something, you have to, at the very least, equal gravity, often ex exceed it, but at the very least, meet it. So, the force we exert upwards will be equal in value to <clears throat> two kilograms times 9.8, but it'll point upwards instead of downwards. So, two kilogram mass times 9.8 to find its weight times our height of three meters, and that should give us, if I remember correctly, 58.8 joules of work. That is the energy required to perform this task. Note that if the box had more mass, if it was heavier, it would take more energy to lift it. Meanwhile, additionally, if we were to lift it higher, that would also take more energy. Combine this with any weight lifting or general heavy object lifting experiences that you've had. How's that one feel? No objections? Are there any objections? Okay. And one more quick example, I want to show you how friction can tie into all this. Let's say we are pushing an object forwards, so we are pushing forwards with a force of 62 newtons. And this object is moving forward at constant velocity. So, this is the force we are applying. It is moving at constant velocity. 
What, therefore, must be the value of the force of friction acting on this object? It would be equal to 62 newtons, just in the opposite direction. Uh, to make sure everyone had this numerically, we are pushing forwards with 62 newtons. And we know that the box is moving at constant velocity, which means it's not accelerating. Since it's not accelerating, net force is equal to mass times acceleration. If acceleration is zero, net force must be zero, which means all the forces present need to add up to zero. We are pushing forwards. Friction opposes movement, so friction will automatically point in the opposite direction by virtue of its definition. And these two forces must add up to zero because we're not accelerating. So, net force, let's just add them together. We have our 62 newton force forwards, force of friction backwards, they add up to zero. Force of friction must be 62 newtons in the opposite direction. We've done at least one other example where this is the case. Whenever you are not accelerating for any reason, all the forces must add up to zero. In the case of moving forwards at constant velocity, the force forwards would need to be equal and opposite with the force of friction. This is exactly what your car does on cruise control. So, you and friction are exerting the same amount of force as the box moves forward. <clears throat> Since you're exerting the same amount of force, in the same axis, just opposite signs, how does the work you are exerting on the box compare to the work that friction is doing on the box? The thing about work is any force can perform work, but because force and displacement are both vectors, the direction matters on top of just checking if they're parallel or not. So let's just say, I didn't put this number up here, we push the box forward by one meter. We exert a 62 newton force, we push it forwards by one meter, that would take 62 joules. Simultaneously, the force of friction is exerting negative 62 joules as it moves, sorry, negative 62 newtons as the box moves one meter forwards. So you plug in the same numbers, it still, it still exerts a force of 62, it's still moving the distance of one, but the force would be negative this time because it points in the opposite direction. So you'd get a negative amount of work. The work we do, pushing forwards, is positive work because we are putting energy into the box, we are trying to accomplish something. But friction, plugging in a negative force with our positive displacement, would give us negative 62 joules. Because friction exists to slow things down and take energy away from them. When something does negative work, it is taking energy away from a system. It is specifically trying to undo whatever you're doing to it. So, when I push my remote across the table, I do work and give it energy, which friction promptly takes away from it, hence why it stops. So friction and negative work in general take energy away from things and slow them down. And because friction is everywhere and we can't really escape it, energy is constantly being drained from things. Um, this is one reason why your muscles get tired. There is friction within your muscle fibers, and that's one reason why they run out of energy eventually. If you are performing a task that should take 100 joules worth of energy, the friction in your own muscles 
actually increases that amount of work because it takes energy away from the process you're trying to do. So if the task takes 100 joules of work, but the friction in your muscles zaps 10 joules away from that, you have to work even harder to make up the difference. Whenever you perform a task, if the task takes, there's some numbers in there. Let's look back at this box, because I have the numbers on the board. You accomplished 500 joules worth of work, but because of friction, it probably took you more energy from your own body than this to actually pull that off. Every time friction exists, it increases energy cost. This is why your car engine will eventually overheat, because friction takes energy away from all of the moving parts, turns it into heat, and you just lose power. I started rambling there because friction is in pain. I apologize. Whenever friction exists, it's doing negative work and taking energy away from something. How's that sound? All right. I've been mentioning the word energy a lot in that last paragraph. So let's talk a bit about what energy is, because we're going to focus on it for a little while. Energy is very weird in terms of physics, because we, technically speaking, still don't really know what it is or how it works. I want you to just think, looking back over your own personal history, has there ever been a time in your life where you have seen energy itself? Electricity. Electricity is a good yes. Um, but electricity is technically made up of moving electrons. Electrons are made of matter, and they're just moving around. So that's not energy, that's just matter moving. Same as my hand moving back and forth. Now it does give off light, but that light is caused by the air the electricity passes through gaining energy and giving off light as a byproduct. So you're not actually seeing energy in the electricity. You are seeing light given off by air. You are not seeing the energy itself. You are given light. You are seeing light given off by an object. What about um, a water, um, what do you call it? A trench or whatever you want to call it? The water just like flows to like... Like waves? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Look, uh, observing the motion of something, for example? Well, it's, a, it's like... Like converts energy by like you know the water flowing through a dam is that a dam? Oh, like a hydro a power plant? Yeah. Okay. Well, water moving that's still an object in motion. Whether it's water, whether it's wind, whether it's steam, there's still an object moving there. So if you see something moving, that's still the object itself. You don't see the energy. You just see the object that has. The energy. Uh, there is even fire, frankly, still isn't energy for the same reason electricity isn't. When you see fire, you're just seeing light given off by hot gas, not the energy itself. We have, to my knowledge, because there's no way to do it as far as I understand the physics, you have never witnessed energy directly. You have only witnessed what things do when they have energy. So the primary properties of energy that we discuss and use in physics is the fact that various different objects can possess energy and do different things with it. You have energy and you use it to do stuff. And that energy can take a lot of different forms as it's transferring between different objects. So the main properties of energy it can be possessed by objects. It can transfer between different objects, like hitting a baseball with a bat, for example. Actually, really just throwing something is a good example. Right now, this is not moving. It has no energy. I give it energy. The energy transferred from my hand into the marker, and then it used it to fly away. So objects can possess energy. It can transfer between objects, and it can also transfer between different states 
of energy. Kind of like different states of matter. Water can be solid, liquid, and gas. Energy can occupy different states and types as well. And we're going to start talking about a few of those different types because energy, kind of like force, is going to be very important for the entire duration of this physics class. Whoops. So, energy can occupy lots of different forms. I want you guys to tell me some forms of energy that you know of or have observed in your life. <clears throat> Fire, very good. Fire is a myriad of energy types all happening at the same time. For one, there's chemical energy involved because before the fire starts, there is energy within the molecules of, say, the log that you're about to burn. Once you ignite it, that starts a chemical reaction where the wood of the log starts reacting with the existing energy and with the oxygen in the air to create fire and heat as a byproduct. So it also creates thermal energy. Thermal energy is the energy of heat. If you are hot, you possess thermal energy. If you are warm, you have energy in the thermal form in your body. And since humans are mammals and therefore warm-blooded organisms, we are constantly creating our own thermal energy, whereas reptiles and fish don't, to my knowledge. At the very least, reptiles don't. That's why they're constantly sunning themselves to stay warm. They don't make thermal energy in their own bodies. But what we do is we eat food, which has chemical energy stored inside of it. Your stomach acid breaks down that food, it turns it into lots of different types of energy for your body to use, but some of it always becomes thermal to keep you warm. And this is why you will always be warmer than reptiles in a cold room. Anyway, um, the chemical, thermal. This probably isn't an official type, but light, fire does give off light, and light might consider to be a form of energy. It, at the very least, it does let energy travel from point A to point B. We get radiant energy from the sun via sunlight. So we get energy via radiation. Whether or not the radiation is a form of energy is still something physicists are debating to this day. But at the very least, fire can give off energy in all of these different forms. Or it starts in this form. It'll become these two by the end. So, very good example. Radiant is what you see, thermal is what you feel, chemical is what it was before it was on fire. Yes. What's another type? A a battery battery one? Mm -hmm. Sorry? Battery? Uh, an electrical battery? Yeah. Very good. So, the energy stored inside of a battery be it your phone or your laptop or what have you, is actually probably stored, well, I would call that to begin with electrical potential energy. Uh, we describe, <coughs> if I use the word potential to describe a form of energy, that means it's sealed. It's basically in a can ready to be used later. So a battery is honestly a perfect example. There's energy in it that will be utilized by some device at a later date. So you could describe the energy in a battery as electrical potential. Electrical energy that's stored to be used later. I will also add chemical potential to that list because most batteries store things within a chemical reaction. Like if you buy double A's at the store, there's acid and lead in there that react to give off electrons and electricity as a byproduct. 
So batteries could be electrical potential, could be chemical potential, kind of the same way food is. Is that another question? Uh, it's kind of off topic. So you said uh, potential like has like stored energy, right? Correct. Then what is gravitational uh, stored? Like, what, like how it be? Great question. So that's a good segue. This is one of the two types of energy we're going to focus on first. Um, gravitational potential energy is not something that non-physicists think or talk about on a regular basis. But eventually you'll realize it's one of those things you had an underlying conceptual knowledge of and have never described. So when you lift something, you're doing work to lift it. You are exerting a force and making it move a distance upwards. So you used up energy doing that lifting. That energy you used up is now sealed as gravitational potential inside of the object you lifted. And that energy is released when it falls. Gravitational potential energy is energy stored in an object's ability to fall. The higher you lift something, the higher it can fall from, the more energy will be released when it falls. It can be a weird thing to think about, but humans have been applying this for a long time. In the case of, let's say we have a waterfall pouring water over a water wheel. As water falls downwards, it has GPE up here because it's some height above the rest of the river. As it falls, that energy is released and that energy will eventually make it into the water wheel and then to whatever the water wheel is connected to. Well, isn't that just gravity? It is gravity. Now, gravity itself is a force, and it's a force that makes objects accelerate. But because it's a force, and because it can make things move a distance, it can do work. We can get energy out of it. When you lift something, you're storing energy in that ability to fall. And then once it falls, that energy is released. Specifically, that energy is released in the form of kinetic. If you ever saw anything move, and that can include your own limbs, anything moving has kinetic energy. This is the form energy takes when matter uses it to be in motion. So if you throw something, you do work and give the object you threw kinetic energy. So now it has a velocity, and then it starts moving away from you. The engine in your car is designed to turn the chemical energy in gasoline into kinetic energy and make your car move forwards. Your muscles take chemical energy from food and turn them into potential energy to move your limbs around. And so these are the two we're going to focus on most at the beginning here. Um, gravitational potential stores energy in the ability to fall. Once it falls, that GPE becomes KE as you are in motion. How's that feel? Okay. I think we talked about most of the major energy types I wanted to reference. Uh, chemical and food. Nuclear is also a form of potential at first. It's energy in an atom until you split it and release it. Uh, thermal. All right, yeah, I think that's most of the types. There's lots of types. We'll start adding more to the list that we commonly use as we go on. We'll eventually do a whole chapter on heat and electricity. Chapters, plural. For right now, We'll focus on these two. And as we're focusing, we'll need some formulas. So the formula for kinetic energy, an object that has mass and is in motion, has some amount of kinetic energy making that possible. To find that amount, you multiply one half 
by the object's mass, by its velocity squared. What this formula tells us is that in order to have kinetic energy, and I abbreviate that to just KE in the formulas, there's not really any shorter way to do that, so it's just gonna be a two letter variable. And since it's a form of energy, it's still measured in joules, the same joules as work. It's all still energy. When an object possesses kinetic energy, um, its mass will determine how fast it can go with that amount of kinetic energy. Say I have a ping pong ball and a bowling ball. I can give both of those objects the same amount of energy. I can give them both 10 joules of kinetic energy as I throw them. But since the ping pong ball has a smaller mass, it can go faster with the same amount of energy. Whereas 10 joules in the mass of a bowling ball is barely gonna make it start rolling. So, the mass and velocity combined give you a picture of how much energy a specific object needs. The more mass something has, the more energy it needs to go fast. And the faster you want to go, the exponentially more energy that's going to take. It is worth noting, because the velocity term is squared, one, like I just said, the faster you go, that takes exponentially more kinetic energy. This is one reason why we don't have light speed travel yet. The faster you go, the more energy that takes. And if you want to go that fast, it will take more energy than exists on the planet. But at the same time, because the velocity term is squared, it doesn't matter if you plug in a positive or a negative velocity. You will still get a positive answer for kinetic energy. That is because energy is not a vector. It doesn't care what direction you're moving in. It just cares that you're moving. No form of energy is a vector. If you get a negative answer for energy, that doesn't mean it points in the negative direction. That just means you lost and have less energy. Energy is not a vector. It doesn't care about the direction. And that's why the D term is squared. So, I'll write that formula down in a second. Let's use it very briefly to compare two objects. We have a bowling ball with a mass of 5,000 grams rolling forwards at three meters per second. We also have a human person walking forwards at one meter per second, and the mass of that human person is 100 kilograms. So which of the two has more kinetic energy? For a frame of reference, one meter per second is typical human walking speed. Depends on the length of your legs, but that tends to be an average for adults. All right, we have one vote for the bowling ball. Any more votes for the bowling ball or any votes for the person? No person? Okay. More votes either way. All right, one more for person. Person's winning. Person. 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 person, human person. All right, the votes are in, and the <coughs> popular opinion and the fact is that the human has more kinetic energy. The reason for this is because I was, I decided to be a little bit tricky. Gave me the mass of the bowling ball in grams. All of our formulas take kilograms, so this number becomes five kilograms. So one half times five times nine comes out to be 22.5 joules. 
One half times one hundred times one is fifty. <coughs> Bless you. So the human does have more energy. You can be moving slower and still have more energy if you have more mass. For example, if you were walking alongside a train, even if you're both moving at the same speed, the train has more energy in it because it's massive and it took more energy to get it moving at that speed. This is why even a slow moving train will hurt you. Um, it is worth noting though, the ball is three times faster. No, actually, never mind. That point wasn't going really anywhere. I was mistaken. So, mass and velocity work together to determine the same answer. Velocity is squared, so it does tend to be the more important variable, but mass shouldn't be ignored. And you need to make sure you're pulling in kilograms. So, anything with mass that is moving has kinetic energy. There is exactly one thing that moves without mass, and that is light. Since it doesn't have mass, it technically doesn't have kinetic energy. It has something else. Questions about Keiki for now. All right. So let's talk about the other form that we will be doing math for, and that's GPE. This is the formula, mass times 9.8 times height. And again, this is a the weirder of the two concepts. It is okay if you still need a little bit of time to, and, and for me to keep explaining what GPE is. Yes. I got a question. Yes, so like, you know, if you've been to like a fair, right? Like you've been to a fair, like you know they ride, it's like called, I think it's called like a gravel train or whatever, and it like spins in circles like real fast. And it presses like, you up against the wall. Yeah, it worked. So that is an application of centripetal force. So not supremely related to this, maybe tangentially related, literally. Um, that has to do with centripetal force. And basically, if I was looking down at that machine from above, so this is the person in the center and you are standing here, it's about to start spinning and eventually you're gonna get pressed up against the wall. As this thing starts spinning, your body wants to leave it because your own inertia wants you to move in a straight line. However, there's a wall behind you that's not letting that happen. So your body wants to exit, but the wall of the machine is behind you, forcing you to stay inside. Um, compare this to like the merry-go-round on a child's playground, just the metal thing that you hang on to and someone spins. Eventually, when you let go, you get flung off of it because your body wants to exit and you have to use force to stay on it. In this case, the force is coming from the wall. So as long as that wall is behind you, you're not going anywhere. It just feels really weird because you're being, you feel like you're being flung against the wall from your own inertia. The wall's pressing up against you with more force than you're used to experiencing and from a direction you're not used to experiencing. All the while, your blood in your body also wants to move in a straight line and ends up pressing against the physical wall of your body, which also feels weird. So you're not in danger, and the physics is all on your side. It just feels wrong, because none of the forces are pointing in the right direction anymore. The wall is pushing you against your back towards the center of the machine and your blood is pressing against your skin. It's a very weird experience. Also, don't move your head because if you try to lean it forwards, but then you give out and you'll slam into the wall behind you. Don't move your head on that ride. Um, so not directly tied to what we've been talking about, but we will spend a unit on that topic. So, GPE, when you lift something, you do work to do so. That means you use up energy in that task. The object you lifted now has that energy. It's not using it, 
It's just sitting there. If you put something up on a shelf, it could fall. It has energy because it could fall, but until it falls, that energy is not doing anything, and that's why it's potential energy. It's basically a battery, just a really weird one that you don't want to be standing under. Um, and technically, we've actually used this formula earlier today. It's this, mass times 9.8 times height, is exactly what we did in the lifting the box question. Mass times 9.8 times height. Like I said, when you lift something, you are doing work, and the energy you use now becomes stored in the object you were lifting. So it's actually the same formula. So work and GP should be the same? They basically, the work you do lifting something gives that object GP. So yes, basically, same formula. Because mg is weight, and we multiply the weight times the height we lift it. Now, Besides the concept being weird, this is also kind of weird because we don't usually put the negative on the G. Because again, energy is not a vector. It doesn't care about the direction. It just cares whether you're gaining it or losing it. So lifting something upwards, you're gaining GPD. You get a positive answer as a result of that. So I suppose to make this as accurate as I possibly could, I would put an absolute value around the G. It doesn't care about the vector direction of gravity. It does care about the direction of the height only because lifting something increases GPD and letting it drop decreases GPD. As you fall, your GPD transforms into K because now you're moving and you're moving faster and faster until you hit the floor. We will utilize this formula and show how it relates to KE next time. Any questions before we break? All right. Uh, do please have a nice day. And if I don't see you for lab this afternoon, I will see you Wednesday for lecture. Uh, if you Whenever you have lab this week, do remember we will do that brief 30-minute thing first, and then we will move on to the lab proper. I'm rambling. Don't let that stop you from the right. So this lab will take longer than usual. It shouldn't. Frankly, all of our ones are still now on the pretty short side. Um, the activity itself won't take long.